Friends, my name is Nizamuddin Ahmed Siddiqui and I am Assistant Professor of Law at West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. I will be taking this module on conceptualizing duties in law of contract, torts and crime. But before we begin, let us look at the learning outcomes of this module. The learning outcomes of the module are number one, to understand the various classifications of duties and relationship between duty and rights. Number two, to understand the duties in contract, torts and criminal law and to be able to relate the duties of public bodies and state in protecting the rights of citizens. And number three, to appreciate the growth of positive duties in protecting right to life and eliminating gender violence. Let us begin our discussion. Friends, legal duty is understandable as something which the law requires to be done or forborn to a determinate person or the public at large, which is correlative to a vested and coextensive right in such person or the public and the breach of which constitutes negligence. These are duties imposed by formal legal rules. Legal duties are distinct from moral or implied duties since when a legal duty is violated, there may be consequences under the law. A legal duty is usually imposed by some type of formal written law, whether it is judge-made law or statutes or laws made by state or federal legislatures. When a person breaches a legal duty or falls short of fulfilling the duties that the state that the law imposes, there are usually some types of consequences that follow. For example, certain legal duties carry with them the potential to be subject to criminal sanctions if a person fails to perform them. If a person violates a legal duty not to kill another person, he will be per prosecuted and potentially imprisoned or even can be put to death for the breach of the legal duty. The government must prove that he violated this legal duty and the legal duty must be, must be constitutional for the government to subject him to these types of sanctions. Duties can be classified as number one, natural and acquired duties. Natural duties bind all of us without any specification by any institution or body. For example, not to harm others. Acquired duties are duties undertaken by individuals by something they have done or as a relationship which they might have with others. Number two, positive and negative duties. According to the eminent legal jurist John Rawls, positive duties require us to do good. On the other hand, negative duties impose restrictions on doing bad or refraining from acting. Number three, perfect and imperfect duties. According to Immanuel Kant, perfect duties expect individuals to discharge the incurred obligations as per the goal that is set always without any deviation. Imperfect duties have no rigidity. Number four, prima facie and all things considered as duties. According to W.D. Ross, people mostly discharge their duties to live up to their promises as a goodwill. This means many a times people perform their duties based on the advantages and disadvantages. Let us now look at the interrelationship between rights and duties. The two phrases rights and duties coexist with each other. In other words, rights and duties are two sides of the same coin that regulate the values and behavioral patterns of an individual. On one side, rights are important in developing the human personality and behavior. Duties, on the other hand, direct individuals importance of contribution for the promotion of social good. In a way, duty targets at the realization of rights guaranteed by various laws and regulations both nationally and internationally. The same philosophy applies to states also to discharge their duties towards their citizens. According to Professor Harold Lasky, every right of an individual automatically imposes a duty on others. For in instance, the right to freedom to move freely or privacy impose a duty on others not to interfere with the right of movement or privacy of any body 
except regulated by law. This implies that every exercise of right is subject to restrictions. For example, one has freedom of speech and expression. Due to it exist in all forms of law, be it contract, torts or crime. Let us try and understand these duties one by one. Duties in the law of contract. Friends, contract is a voluntary binding agreement between two or more competent parties. They are usually written, but they can also be spoken or implied contracts. In earlier times, the concept of contract evolved from the contractual theory of Thomas Hobbes. However, in present times, contract sees its use in tenancy contracts, employment contracts or some common example of contracts. In earlier times, the concept of contract evolved from the contractual theory of Thomas Hobbes. However, in present times, contract sees its use in tenancy contract and employment contracts to give an example. In law of contracts, there are two different theories that have been argued by jurists. First is the power principle and second is the obligation principle. On the power conferring picture, contract is a sort of legislative act in which persons determine what law will apply to their transaction. However, on the duty imposing picture, contract law places duties on persons entering into agreements for consideration whether they want them or not. Some lawyers like Patrick Atia argue that contract law ought to correct the harms done by unfulfilled promises in contracts and to prevent the promisers unjust enrichment by following remedial principles. Similarly, Freud's commitment to the principle respect for others as free and rational requires taking seriously their capacity to determine their own values, explain his account of contract law as enforcing the moral obligation to perform one's promises. A contract between A and B creates a duty for A to deliver the car to B in honest faith and creates a duty for B to pay the promised consideration in return. These duties have in turn created respective rights for the parties concerned. So by entering into a legally enforceable agreement, the parties create new duties for themselves or modify or extinguish old ones. According to the expanded antecedent argument, legal powers are not a distinct category of laws, but are terms in the antecedents of conditional duties. In the example mentioned above, A and B by entering into a contract have subjected themselves to such obligations which they cannot manipulate if they wish to. They owe an obligation to each other which if breached would cause harm to one of the parties. This explains that the natural explanation of the more relaxed conditions of contractual validity is that contract law does not only function to confer powers. It also imposes legal duties on those who enter into agreements for consideration simply because they have entered into an agreement for consideration, not because the parties want those legal duties. This is not yet to say just what those duties are, whether for example, contract law imposes a duty to perform, a duty to perform if efficient or a duty to compensate for the harms caused by breach. But the relatively forgiving condition of contractual validity are prima facie evidence that we should attribute some duty imposing function to contract law. But even if we reject the power conferring reading of the consideration requirement and allow that contract law functions to impose duties, it becomes difficult to ignore the fact that many parties expect and want their agreements to be legally enforceable. If for no other reason, then the legal enforcement enables mutually beneficial transactions that would otherwise fail for a lack of trust and many contract doctrines are structured in ways that anticipate or even enable such purposive uses of contract law. Implied duties are created by judges based on public policy and contractual relationships. A reasonable 
supplement deemed necessary by interpreting the contract that was made. So if you hire a contractor to build a house, the contractor has an implied duty to build it in a good and workmanlike manner, even if the contract is silent on the point. This standard is understood in the trade and promotes confidence in the construction industry. The implied duty of good faith governs how each party's discretionary tasks are accomplished. It requires a party with discretion, for example, to exercise that discretion reasonably and in accordance with the reasonable expectations of the parties. So if the party responsible for getting office space rented from a building, it owned at above market rates, the other party or parties could complain that the party making the rented agreement has violated the obligation of good faith and fair dealing. The concept of good faith, also known as bona fide or bona fide, has existed at least since the development of Roman law and is believed by some to have even preceded natural law. Bona fide contracts were originally distinguished from strict juris formal contracts which were enforceable only by satisfying certain legal requirements. Good faith has been given an even more fundamental basis in natural law which enlarged the narrow pragmatic rule otherwise known as pacta sunt servanda that promises and agreements must be kept. Cicero in his treatise on duties attributed to promises such force that he called good faith the foundation of justice. Law of contract is based upon the idea of good faith that also confers a duty upon the parties not to act against the doctrine of good faith. Friends, let us now understand the concept of duties in law of torts. Torts are wrongdoings that are done by one party against the other. As a result of the wrongdoing, the injured person may take civil action against the other party. For example, the instances of trespassing, defamation or slander. Torts are wrongdoings that are done by one party against another. As a result of the wrongdoing, the injured person may take civil action against the other party. For example, the instances of trespassing and defamation. Let us understand the role of duty in tort law. Friends, an inherent sense of duty is also inherent in law of torts. But lawyers at least must be careful to distinguish between a duty which is better characterized as a social obligation and true legal duties or responsibilities which are enforceable by claims for damages. For example, a road accident victim cannot bring an action against me if I stood beside him at the roadside as he prepared to cross and failed to suggest he looked to his right before crossing the busy road and was flattened by the approaching lob lorry. Nor do I have any legal liability if I fail to shout a warning to the absent-minded wanderer who is striding along with head in air oblivious to the approaching cliff's edge. Why not? The pedestrian would have escaped injury if I had spoken out. My cliff walker would have looked up and saved himself. So why have I no responsibility for them in law? All I had to do was to be neighborly and careful. Is that too much to ask? The explanation can only be given. All I had to do was to be neighborly and careful. Is that too much to ask? The explanation can only be that in all those cases, law imposes no duty of care. But why should that be? The classical answer is to be found in the three-part test identified in Caparo Industries versus Dickman, which is now very well known. The application of that decision means that a duty of care will depend on number one, foreseeability number two, proximity, and number three, it being legally just and reasonable duty that is imposed by law. In Bishara versus Sheffield teaching hospitals at paragraph 11, Sedley Lord Justice said, assumption of responsibility is simply one of the ways in which the necessary degree of proximity may arise. In some types of cases, the existence of the duty is so well established as to be entirely uncontroversial. For instance, in the case of an employer 
there can be no doubt that regardless of any contractual obligation, the employer owes a duty to his employee to take reasonable care for the safety of his employees. Clearly, the important features of assumption of responsibility and reliance are present in all those cases. Historically, a distinction was drawn by the law between the existence of a duty to present physical harm and a duty not to expose someone to adverse economic consequences. But as the law of negligence developed to allow claims for purely economic loss to be pursued in each case, and it was necessary for the courts to reconsider the limits and preconditions for such liability of one of the key factors that has been the assumption of responsibility by A towards B's reliance upon A to conduct himself carefully. The history of the duty in relation to purely economic loss can conveniently be traced from cases such as Headley Bryan versus Heller to the very much more recent case and to some the locus classicus for the true test of Caparo Industries versus Dickman. Although Caparo itself was a case about economic loss, the principles for the existence of a duty of care in all tort actions are clearly expressed within it and are the foundation of any analysis in the case of both economic and physical damage. The validity of this parallel was confirmed in Mitchell versus Glasgow, where it was argued unsuccessfully that, as Capero was concerned only with economic loss, it had no or little application to personal injury claims. There are, of course, countless authorities in which the duty of care of a public authority has been debated and established or rejected. Highways cases are one such category where questions have arisen as to the scope, existence and nature of any statutory or common law duty that may be owed. In Stovin v. Wise, a majority of the House of Lords held that the highway authority owed no duty to the member of the public who suffered injury at a crossroads where visibility was restricted. The failure to exercise its power to re require the removal of the obstruction which was on someone else's land was an omission only and that was not actionable. The highway authority had done nothing positive. It was a case of simple omission and therefore excluded as a matter of policy from the arena of tort liability. The situation may be different where a public authority takes an active steps such as where it issues a license without which the activity in question would be permissible. The situation may be different where a public authority takes an active step such as where it issues a license without which the activity in question would be impermissible. That is where the judge rejected the contention that there had been any assumption of responsibility. In the case of Gorringe versus Calderdale, the House of Lords rejected the argument that the local authority owed a duty of care to paint markings on the road or put up sign warnings motorists to allow slow down. But again, no single test will apply to any situation. In the case of Gorringe versus Calderdale, the House of Lords rejected the argument that the local authority owed a duty of care to paint markings on the road or put up sign warnings for motorists to slow down. But again, no single test will apply to every situation. Friends, let us now discuss the concept of duties in criminal law. Criminal law, one of the two broad categories of law, deals with acts of intentional harm to individuals which in a larger sense are offences against us all. A crime is a deliberate or reckless act that causes harm to another person or another person's property and it is also a crime to neglect a duty to protect others from harm. A crime is a deliberate or reckless act that causes harm to another person or another person's property. It also is a crime to neglect 
a duty to protect others from harm. Let us discuss right to life and positive duties in this context. In a variety of jurisdictions, the right to life gives rise to positive duties that the state must fulfill to protect it. In Osman versus United Kingdom, the court developed a wide-ranging general duty out of the right to life, which set aside the exclusionary rule in the UK, preventing the police from being held liable in negligence claims for failure to investigate crime. According to the European Convention on Human Rights, a state has a general duty to individuals to protect their right to life. It is required to legislate effective criminal law provisions to deter the commission of offences against the person backed up by law enforcement machinery for the prevention, suppression and sanctioning of breaches of such provisions. However, states are only under a specific obligation in certain well-defined circumstances to take proactive, preventive operational measures to protect an individual whose life is at risk from the criminal acts of another. This specific obligation only raise, arises where the authorities knew or ought to have known of the existence of a real and immediate risk to the life of an, un, of an identified individual and that they fail to take measures within their powers which judge reasonably might have been expected to avoid that risk. This delimited specific duty is clearly framed and informed by tortious notions of causation and responsibility. After this landmark judgment on duty towards right to life of people, many cases have been brought up in different courts regarding positive duty arising under the right to life and the question of whether the state has fulfilled the general positive duty. The cases where a breach of the general duty has been found have most clearly centered on the state's failure to properly investigate a death. This constitutes a breach of an ancillary procedural obligation under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which talks about right to life, to conduct an effective investigation into the death and instigate criminal proceedings where necessary. Since the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, also known as CEDAW, was adopted by the UN General Assembly, gender violence has been the subject of extensive international law activity. This includes the 19th General Recommendation of the CEDAW Committee, which notes that states should take appropriate and effective measures to overcome all forms of gender-based violence, whether by public or private, and to ensure that laws against family violence and abuse, rape, sexual assault, and other gender-based violence give adequate protection to all women and respect their integrity and dignity. Similarly, General Assembly, while declare, declaring on the elimination of violence against women, enshrines a due diligence standard and enjoins state to pursue by all appropriate means and without delay a policy of eliminating violence against women including exercising due diligence to prevent, investigate and in accordance with national legislation punish acts of violence against women, whether those acts are perpetrated by the state or by private persons. The international duty of due diligence with respect to the treatment of violence against women is also supported by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe in their recommendation of the year 2002, which obliges states to penalize all non-consensual sexual acts, including where the victim does not show resistance. India has continuously adopted such principles to protect women through various judgments and laws. This imposes a duty on the state 
and also on the people to prevent any such acts against the law and also to act positively in order to ensure that such rights are enforced. A number of decisions by the European Court of Human Rights have developed protective duties with respect to domestic violence and violence against children. Friends, to conclude, we can say that duties are imposed by formal legal rules and are classified into several categories. Rights and duties coexist together and are two sides of the same coin that regulates the values and behavioral patterns of an individual. There is a duty to act in good faith in contract law. Duty of care is developed in tort law through various case laws and takes into consideration economic laws as well. States have been made responsible and a duty has been established upon them to protect right to life of its subjects. With this, we come to the conclusion of this module. I thank you for your patient hearing.